So now we still talk about care, but go on the other end of the life course and we'll speak about involved fathers. Not easy to translate involved fathers. We have a lot of labels that we use, but I decided to use involved fatherhood as a case study. I think it's an interesting case study to understand gender innovation and the detraditionalization process in the intimate sphere. Uh, so in the, there is a huge sociological debate about what is happening in the intimate sphere and I sort of sit with Neil Gross and with his theories uh, sort of in opposition with Giddens and all this group of theorists because I don't think that the detraditionalization process that is undergoing in the private sphere is so linear and without ambivalences. So I am quite interested in these ambivalences. Um, I will jump over the whole methodological plot that I could tell you about my research. Uh, just very briefly, um, I am presenting here some results of a qualitative research that I conducted in Sydney, Australia, three years ago, with involved fathers. Better, with self-identified involved fathers. This is very important because I went around with my leaflet that would say, do, are you an, an involved father? Do you think you do a lot of things with your children? I would like to talk to you. So this is very important in order also to understand my results. Um, so fathers living in Sydney with small kids, uh, aged zero, three years. So this was my target, let's say. I did interview uh, 13 couples, so I went to fathers and mothers separately of the same couples. Um, so we are talking about straight couples and white Australians. White Australians is still a very big group because they have very different um, backgrounds, cultural backgrounds, but I decided to keep it as little as possible. So. All the rest, if you're interested, I'm going to tell you which kind of interviews I did, etc. But I'm now very interested in presenting you the typology that emerged from my research. As you know, we do qualitative research and then we try to find links uh, amongst different fathers that we met. And the two important dimensions in, in, in reading through the experiences of these fathers are on one side the working life, so did they change their participation to the working life or not? And the care duties, do they participate a lot in care duties or not? Okay, uh, briefly, when I did these interviews, it was, as I told you, 2012, and Australia did not have a national plan for paternity leave. So parents who could take paternity leave is because in the, in the places where they worked, they had these kind of benefits. So it's a very neoliberal uh, situation coming from where we sit here now. Right, so the first type, interchangeable parent. Uh, just two of the 13 participants are part of this group, so it's a little minority. And Toby is somehow representative of this group. You know, Toby is my ideal type of interchangeable parent. So Toby decided to take paternity leave and to stay home with his children, child or children. He experiences what it means to be the primary carer. And Toby's partner works either full-time or part-time. Toby goes through the same often traumatic experiences of the adjustment, as some mothers said, or the surrender. So when describing breastfeeding, one mother was telling me, and I quote, so I think you just have to surrender at the end. You have to forget that you want to do stuff and accept that you are not going to achieve all the things that you want to. And Toby speaks about going through depression, he used this word. I went through a kind of postnatal depression, he was saying, as he realized that he's stuck 
at home with the kids. And he discovers all the invisible work implied in caring, and this awareness brings him closer to the partner, to his partner. Toby's partner is very assertive and pretends gender equality. She's also aware of the difficulties implied in caring and in being home with small kids. So she manages to be very supportive towards Toby. Going through the same experiences makes them a very strong couple and a very supportive couple. Toby speaks about himself as having been domesticated in the past. You know, he says, since I was young, I did some housework, and this made him, him feel able somehow to care for the kids. He grew up with a quite traditional dad, dad that was not showing much affection towards him. His dad, for example, he says, he never hugged me really, my dad. You know? And even today when we meet, we shake hands. So when he decided to take paternity leave, his friends were all very curious about this choice, but could not completely understand him. And the main joke they would make is like, ah, you will play with the Xbox for the whole day, you know, with video games for the whole day. So this is how Toby speaks about this surrender that he has to experience and to go through. So he would say, I come from a role where I was a bank manager. So coming from this role to a role where, where I was stuck at home and my priorities every day were feeding and changing the nappies, keeping up with washing, the laundry, tidying up, making dinner. It was very different to my corporate life and it takes some adjustment. Very interesting, as I was saying, I mean, I call the first type interchangeable parent, not father. Very interesting and very important is the role of the partner. And this is how his partner speaks about the giving up of, of the power that is implied in, you know, uh, the, 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 the being the primary carer. So she says, for example, very emblematic, I remember one party that we went to. And our daughter was just half through Toby's parental leave, so she was at home with her father. And she was just screaming at the party, and so I went to reach for her, and she said, no, I want daddy. You really can see the, the scene, no? And everyone, everyone just went, ooh, the kind of saying, oh, oh, she doesn't want mommy, she wants daddy. I did not know how to take it, tells me the mother. At the first, I was a bit taken aback. I must be a terrible mother. No, somehow she shot, thought. But then we talked about it with a partner, and it makes actually sense that whoever is the primary caregiver is the one the child wants. But still, it was a bit of a slap for me when it happened, but big shoulders. So the characteristics of this first type of, let's say, an interchangeable parent is, is that it's a conscious choice ba made by the couple. Uh, they have the possibility of taking paternity leave, you could say. They earn good money, both earn good money, and can decide to stay at home. They are both equally able to, to be alone with the children, and the partner or wife is very assertive. She plays a very strong role in these choices. The ties uh, in the couple are very strong and there is high trust. There is very low conflict because of a constant negotiation that they go through and because of the similar experiences that they make on the everyday practices. So these are the very gender innovative relationships that I found. Okay, two out of 13. The second type is what I called the gender, gender equal father. So the gender equal is the one who did not change his working life, but is quite high and very present in the, in the care duties. Again, here we have two out of 13 participants that are this kind of gender equal father. And Dan is representative of this narrow group. So Dan does not change his working schedule, but, he, but when he's with his children, he does 
everything. He has very strong ties with his wife or partner and stresses the importance of gender equality. So very aware in speaking about gender equality. His involvement with the children can be seen by the fact that the daughter calls out also for the dad during the night if she wakes up, not only for the mother. He does much of the housework and he is able to be alone with the children for more than a couple of hours. Uh, the mother has not to make it easy for him. He's able to deal on everything. When he's alone with the kids, he's alone with the kids, sorry, when she works or just if she has to go away for a couple of days. Then describes his relationship with his dad as a very warm relationship, but still very formal. They never commun communicate much, and generally they prefer to talk about impersonal stuff like football. He rarely, rarely goes out for a beer with his friends. He rather invites friends at home. His partner is still the primary carer and enjoys the control over the family. She does not want to let go of this control that she has. She's very comfortable in her role or, of mother, and she is a working mom either full-time or part-time. She consciously tries not to interfere with dance activities with the children, and this couple has very similar views on parently, parenting. That is why the conflict is very low, not of, because of constant arguing. And this is dance descriptions of his everyday life. So he would say, you may get up, get up at five o'clock in the morning and start your day. And one of the big things that you do not realize before you have children is, the, is that you come home and you don't sit down for five minutes. You just don't sit down for one minute. You just walk into the house and have to do stuff. You don't get your own headspace for yourself. This is hard. This is one of the reasons why it's surely hard being at home with the kids for the whole day. And when I asked them to describe the differences between him and his partner in caring, this is what he says. So there is a very obvious thing with the breastfeeding. Other than that, I would struggle to think of any qualitative differences between my role and her role in their lives. If I have them, the kids, I have them. If she has them, she has them. We both do all the things that need to be done. The fact is that I have done a lot more paid work than she has during the last three years, and so she has got them more often than I do. But we both know how to do the stuff that needs to be done, because we both do it. The main thing is housework, constant housework. So you see how they engage. So the characteristics, characteristics of the second type is that he works full time, but when he's with the children, he is just with the children and he does everything. He's able to be alone with the children for more than just a couple of hours. And the partner has and shows to have a lot of trust in leaving the children with him. The conflict is very low in this couple, but just because they have very similar view in parenting, not at all because of negotiations. They are gender equal, but not gender innovative relationships. The third one is the, the father I call the mediated father. Again, just three out of 13 participants are a mediated father. And Mike is representative of this narrow group. Interesting, Mike presented himself to me when I did the interview, and, and he manages to pass as an interchangeable father, so as the first type, the gender innovative one. But after having spoken with his wife, I realized that he's not. He presents himself as being more involved than he actually is. He did change work, or at least working schedules, working time, because he wanted to be involved, but also because he did not really like his job. He's older than the other fathers, so he has the seniority to change job without risking too much. He was also in a position of being able to change in job. 
Even if he's often at home, he does not completely take over and he never had the experience of being the primary carer. He makes sure that he's always assisted by grandparents, babysitters and daycare when his partner is not at home with the kids. She cooks for the whole family. And when he's alone with the children, his wife makes it easy for him and prepares everything. Mike feels the pressure of having to be an involved dad. Now in Australia there is a very strong debate and discourse about having to be a very involved dad. And this type of father really feels it. He feels the pressure, pleasure, pressure of having to be involved. But at the same time, he still has the role of the disciplinarian dad. And this is a huge contradiction. He feels very much part of his children's life and wants to be part of the daily choices and wants to say his opinion. And this implies a very high level of negotiation that is needed in the couple and a very high level of conflict in the couple. Mike's partner is stressed. She is very stressed. She does not trust him when he's alone with the children. And when she comes home from work, she often hears the children crying and Mike arguing with them. They also often argue about how the child needs to be raised. She thinks that Mike did not change his life according to the children, but they are just add-ons. This is what they would say in his life. But Mike helps his partner in having again some time for herself. For example, by insisting that the kids have to go to childcare for four days a week, even if she just works for three days in a week, so that she has some free time for herself. So Mike helps her a lot in overcoming the sense of guilt of not being there with the kids constantly. So this is how a mediated father and Mike speaks about the relationship with his children. He says, his mom is the most important person in his life, not me. And that's okay, I understand that. This is how little boys are, sort of you know, diminishing that. They have a, a wonderful relationship, the mom and the little boy, and I like watching it. I just have to get used to the idea that I'm the second best. And when asked to think about the differences between how he and his partner care for the kids, he says, her care would be more regular and constant because she would be with him more often. I try to check myself and make sure that I'm not always the tough, the angry dad. We had a laugh three months ago when he, the child, said to me, my dad is not angry today. And this really stopped me in my tracks because it made me think that my child probably thinks that my regular state of being is to be angry. And this is not the truth. Also, it is to him. So the characteristic of this third type is that they are older than the other fathers and they have the seniority to change the job. They can do that without risking. But he still is not the primary carer. When alone with the children, the partner prepares the chores. The tension, they live a very strong tension. They all speak about the, ten the tension of a desire to be involved, but of having also to have the role of, of being the disciplinarian dad. The partner has very low trust regarding the care abilities of the father, and there is a very high conflict in this couple over care choices. There is a high level of stress that I could sort of sense. The partner expresses dissatisfaction at his lack of change. The ch children are add-ons. He did not really change his life. So these are gender traditional relationships. And then, surprisingly to me, we have the first type that I called the minister of leisure, which involves six out of 13 participants, it's a lot, it's more half of, my, of the sample of self-identified involved fathers, so I did not expect to find something like that. And Bob is my minister of leisure, he's the representative of this larger group, is the ide ideal type. So Bob is a breadwinner with a twist. 
He does not change his working hour. He is the primary breadwinner. And when he comes home, he does the usual dead things with a child. So he plays with a child and, and bath the child. Bob does not change much um, now that he's a father. He seems to be very resistant to what change. For example, he stresses that he still practices, practices all the sports that he did before the children were born. If Bob wife's, Bob's wife has to go away for work, the grandparents step in and help. So, you know, help comes in. It's not Bob who cares for the child. Bob did not overcome his fears of being alone with the children for more than some hours at a day, and is not able or not willing to be the primary carer. He does not trust himself because he hasn't had the time to build up this confidence. His partner is primarily in charge of the children. She tries to protect Bob's sleep, you know, because he has to work. It's this kind of rhetoric in the couple. They get much support from the grandparents. And Bob's partner is less assertive than the other partners I could speak to. Uh, and she is the bad cop in the couple. So she is the disciplinarian parent. And on the top of that, she does everything for the household. And she is very stressed. Some of these mothers was al would almost collapse during the interviews that I was doing at, in the evenings at their homes because of how tired they were. So she overburdens herself with responsibilities and with everyday duties in order to make his experience of fatherhood a light and pleasant one. In order to protect him from having to face a too radical change in his life. And she's scared of losing him if the fathering experience becomes too much for him. Mm? These are very gender traditional couples. And this is very interesting how Bob describes the differences in how he and his partners care. So he says she does, does a lot more, particularly on the caring side of things in terms of meal, laundry, making the kids a bath, organize for the schooling, coordinating with the grandparents for babysitting, washing the kids, all that stuff she does significantly more than I do. What this also means is that she has a lot of responsibility and the flip side of that is that I get to be the good time dad quite a bit of the time. So, you know, very conscious about these differences. And when asked he, if he would swap, you know, to change with a, with a wife, he says, I'd like to think that I can, but I don't know. When I do a couple of days at home, I think, fantastic, it's just me and the kids, and we are having a great time. But if I, I would extend that over more than maximum two days, I don't know. You know, I would have no problems with the kids, but there would be additional work and responsibility. And you, might fi you may find that there is a big pile of dishes and laundry that is backed up. I mean, at work I have to be very disciplined and organized, and I tend to lose it as soon as I get home if I know that I can do that. So the characteristics of this fourth type, that is almost half of my sample, is that he is the primary breadwinner. And his main task as a father is to play with the kids. He is very resistant to change and has a kind of sense of entitlement of being this kind of leisure father. He's never alone with the children for longer periods. And the partner really protects him from change and from demanding care duty. There would always be, you know, I don't want him to get too tired, he has to work, so this very old rhetorics. The partner shows high levels of stress and burdens herself with his responsibilities. And it's a very, very clear relationship survival mechanism. They know that the, probably the relationship would break if this would be not like that. So these are very gender traditional relationships. So just to, to close, um, what does it mean in terms of detraditionalization? I would say that there is a very strong confusion and, and still very visible tensions between old and new ideals and practices. 
you know, they still both somehow prevail in the everyday. And sexism is somehow still very present in these couples. As we could see, different experiences of fatherhood, and I think about the first two types, the more, let's say, innovative, open up the current symbolic order and legitimize different masculinities. These experiences entail a radical reorganization of the gender order. And somehow these parents are very conscious about what they are doing, but they still involve a minority of fathers. And a, a, an important mechanism is that, uh, that, that plays a very important role is the willingness of women to assert their rights. So mothers still play a very strong role in somehow pushing the, the fathers and in opening up uh, this kind of new idea. They have to fight against this new liberal imaginary that wants mothers to be, you know, to embody the kind of idealization of being the perfect mother and the perfect uh, worker, the good worker. These women recognize the freedoms implied in not having to be essential, you know, in being able to afford imperfection, in being a mediocre mother, as Bad Inter was writing recently. So. I would say that overall, overall I could find sense and sense signs of change, but very weak ones, especially if we think that my population was a very specific one. Thank you.